And yes, delighted to have um, everybody here today. And this is what I would refer to as a sort of a, a, a brave space, both for our speaker and um, for all of you attending. Um, we do want it to have, have it um, to, to, for it to be real um, and uh, authentic. And so please do feel free to, to ask the questions that are going to be most uh, helpful for you to hear a response to. And we can always edit those out um, should you decide that you do not want them recorded for posterity. Having said that, the point behind this little series is to get all of the information that doesn't show up on a CV. The, the name of the series behind the CV is very literal. So we are trying to, um, you know, try to demystify what actually happens as you're traversing your life from point A to point B to part C, whatever. Um, and it's not never, never linear. It always sort of bounces around. Um, and yet it can seem intimidating from the outside when you're looking at a, sort of a fully formed, successful human being's life from the outside. Um, uh, you don't really get to see all of the detours that happen along the way. So rather than giving a whole long introduction, which would be very easy to do with our speaker today, I'm going to hand it over and he's going to just jump off. All right. Uh, so thanks for the, the invitation to, to be here. It's a real honor to, to share parts of my story. So uh, I was told to just maybe to start to talk about how I got to where I, I am today. I made some, some notes to help so I don't veer off too much, but let's see how far it goes. And then I guess we'll open up for, for Q&A. So I'm a Philadelphia native, uh, born and raised in the Germantown section of, uh, of Philly. And I think, you know, if you would have asked me when I was seven or eight years old what I wanted to do in my life, I would have said I wanted to be a scientist. And it wasn't because I knew any scientists per se, but um, it just was exposure with nature. Um, so in third grade, I went to the John B. Kelly School in the, in the Germantown section of Philly, and uh, I had this teacher, I actually just reconnected with him on, on Facebook uh, a few weeks ago, which was quite a, a momentous occasion virtually to, to let him know how much he, he did for me. So, so this teacher, Mr. Moore, and this school uh, you know, wasn't the most uh, well-resourced school, but the nature is free, right? And uh, he would take us to, to local marshes and creeks and spend a lot of time telling us about what animals were there and plants and digging up rocks and turning things over. And I just had so much fun doing that type of stuff that uh, I knew, you know, I wanted to do something within the scientific realm. I had no idea what a career or life in science looks like as a third grader, but those are the things that, that really fascinated me. Um, so I had a lot of pets growing up as well. Uh, dogs and cats, uh, lizards, uh, turtles. I think um, there was like this this magazine. I don't know what the name of it is, but I had a subscription to this magazine of like Turtle Digest or something like that. And I like saved up my allowance money to to, to get this magazine to learn, learn all about turtles, their native habitats, how to what they eat and, and things of that nature. So I was always fascinated by biology, science, and, and the like. And and I also would say. Now, I think TV, television gets a bad rap, but you know, for me, this also was a part of it, looking at like National Geographic and Animal Planet. And at one point I thought I wanted to maybe be a field biologist. I used to love just watching shows of this biologist, you know, exploring nature out in the wild doing, doing field science. So, so fast forward, so, so I'm just painting the picture that I've just always been in love with science. So fast forward to high school, I went to uh, Central High School here in Philly in the, uh, the Omni section. And, and maybe some people know it's, it's, a, it's a magnet high school, um, selective high school here in the city. It's a wonderful school. And uh, ninth grade, we had, I had the, uh, the option to take honors biology, which, which I did. And that came with two class periods of uh, biology. And those two class periods meant that I had to forego gym class as well. Now, I remember some people at the time, like, you know, who gives up gym class as a, as a freshman in high school? But, you know, for me, it meant that I got, I got to take two class periods of biology. So I jumped, jumped at that. And it also meant we got to do a year-long science fair project. So uh, many of my classmates at the time elected to do, like, their research after school here at Penn or Temple, Drexel, LaSalle, et cetera. 
but but I actually elected to do the research at home. I was able to like the school had resources to buy rudimentary equipment and, and things of that nature to do some basic level experiments. So that ninth grade year in high school, I, I took over the, the third floor of, of our my parents' home in Germantown. Um, and the experiment was working with crayfish. So I had hundreds of crayfish all over the, the third floor. And uh, definitely salute my parents for, for just always being uh, very supportive of me. They're not scientists, but they saw this was a passion of mine and, and they certainly did what they could to, to foster that for me. So I'm greatly appreciative of that. And uh, so, yeah, I had these, these crayfish and the experiment was to, to spike their uh, drinking water with this herbal supplement ginseng and to test the rates of regeneration. Because if you sever an appendage in, in crayfish, they, they can regrow their legs. So I had the hypothesis that giving them ginseng would speed up this rate of, of regrowth. I actually don't know how the experiments turned out, but I, I know I did pretty well. Um, I won a first place science fair award here in the city, in Philly. And uh, it was a great time. I got to become a scientist. I got to have a lab notebook, design experiments, record my observations and things. And uh, that, that first place of work allowed me to compete at the statewide level. So I went up to Penn State, stayed there for three or four days and competed with kids across the state. Um, so, so really like, again, this is just solidifying my desire to, to, to be a scientist or work within the biomedical uh, space. So then off to, to college, I, uh, I went to North Carolina a and State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. And uh, this is an HBCU, a historically black college. So, so now maybe I'll just interface race, begin to talk about race and, and its role in my life. Um, so my parents, I have a strong family tradition of these sorts of schools, HBCUs. My parents uh, met and attended, graduated from Howard University in Washington, DC. And uh, actually my grandparents, my grandfather went to an HBCU as well. And so I always grew up hearing about HBCUs and this hair and the, the, the virtues of HBCUs being extolled. And uh, interestingly, like my grandparents, so my grandmother went to Westchester University in the 1940s and which is a predominantly white institution. And uh, my grandfather went to Lincoln University, which is a historically black college, actually some debate, but it's probably the first HBCU in the nation. There's a debate whether Lincoln versus Cheney, but so anyway, he, he went to that university and he had this a fabulous time um, a, as, an, as an HBCU student. He actually was a, a minister. So after Lincoln, he went on to get a, a master's degree in divinity. There was a Lutheran divinity school here in the Germantown section. He actually took classes there alongside Martin Luther King Jr. It's a, a, a fun fact. But anyway, so he had a great experience at this HBCU, whereas uh, my grandmother, she had a, a really tough time at the PWI. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this on Twitter, like she, for example, there was like a swimming requirement, but blacks weren't allowed to use the swimming pool, even though they were tuition paying students. So my grandmother would take the bus an hour up to, or hour and a half to Westchester, do some classes, take the bus back to South Philadelphia where she could use the YMCA that allowed blacks to swim. And she recorded herself. She taught herself to swim and recorded herself, her, her lap time and, and took those notes back, put the bus back to Westchester to show her professor that she was proficient in swimming. So she had lots of challenges. So, um, so when my grandparents had kids, my father and siblings, they made, they, they were like, we're sending all our kids to an HBCU. So my dad went to Howard, his sister also went to Howard. Uh, one, one brother went to Morgan State University, an HBCU in Baltimore, and another went to Virginia State, an HBCU in Virginia. So the point is I had all these HBCU graduates around me from parents to aunts and uncles, grandfather, and, and uh, so when I applied to colleges, I only applied to HBCUs. And the, the idea, the plan was uh, to, to think about a graduate or professional school at an Ivy League or Ivy pair, an elite institution, but to get that grounding and foundation at an HBCU. 
Uh, so I took my parents' word for it uh, or, or trusted them and relatives that I should just really get grounded at an HBCU. So this is why a, a large part of why I went to the South to, to this university. Most HBCUs are, are in the South. Um, this uh, school focus had a strong science sort of background. And so when I went to college, I was a, uh, and also too, like, one reason to go to an HBCU was uh, because I was forced, no. And, but uh, because I, I had never really known any African-American scientists and I realized, you know, I wanna move in this space. It, it would probably be useful for me to begin to actualize myself in this, in this discipline by having peers and mentors and role models who, who are practitioners, who are scientists and medical doctors and the like. So uh, I, I went to, to college and I was actually a pre-vet animal science major. Um, and, you know, in, in retrospect, I think I, uh, because I didn't know any scientists, I thought, okay, you go away to college. I love animals. I love biology. I guess I should be a vet. But, um, you know, long story short, I, uh, I interned at a number of vet clinics throughout college and including, including some up here in Philly when I would come home over the summers and it just didn't do it for me. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite monotonous and routine. The, the, the thrill and passion of discovery wasn't there for me. For that regard, medicine will hold that same sort of uh, ethos for me. Um, obviously we need medical doctors and vets, but um, it, it's just not my, my cup of tea. I need something more fast paced. I need to feel like I'm putting knowledge in the textbooks, not just being a recipient of the knowledge. And um, so I actually uh, reached a, a crisis point, I remember, because I was a junior in college and I thought, you know, I wanted to be a veterinarian, but now I'm a junior and I'm like, I actually don't like this. What am I gonna do? I need to change majors. I still love science, but this is not what I want. And then fortunately I was able to do an internship here at Penn through the SUIP program, which is still in existence today. Uh, summer undergraduate internship program specifically geared towards getting underrepresented minority students access to, you know, a lab uh, of the caliber here at Penn. So I worked with Professor Glenn Raddis at the time over in the uh, biomedical research building, BRB. He was in the cell and developmental biology program. So I did work that summer looking at uh, protein molecules in, in heart cells in mice that were like important for heart development. And I had a fabulous time and that was the summer of 2005. And I just fell in love with molecular biology, cell biology, developmental biology, genetics. And you know, I haven't looked back really since that summer. So then when I was applying for uh, graduate programs, uh, so I was convinced I wanna get a PhD. I finally learned about, okay, like this, this is what you do if you wanna become a scientist. And, continue to work on these sorts of problems. And so I applied to, to graduate programs, and, but, but Penn stood out for me. For one, I wanted to, it allowed me to come back home, back to Philly after being in the South for four years, uh, away from friends and family, even though I love my time down there. Uh, Penn's a big place and it allowed me to, I had many different interests, so it allowed me to rotate across different labs I, uh, I joined the cell and molecular biology program and, and looking back on that in hindsight, I think um, it does illustrate uh, uh, how I kind of, this is my interest and curiosity and, and passion and that I had, I never, I, never had, I never took a molecular biology class in undergraduate. And here I am about to start a PhD in molecular biology. I've never taken a class in it. I just got exposed to it in the lab that summer and just super fascinated and said, this is where I want to go. And I was able to convince the admissions committee that I can learn this science that I've never taken if you let me in. And, uh, you know, fortunately they did. Um, yeah, so I came here to Penn and, uh, you know, I started early since I was back in the, in the city. So uh, between undergraduate and grad school, I just had like a two week off period. I graduated the middle of May and then started Penn like June 1. Um, yeah, 
I, I just kind of always jump head first into things <laughs> before I have time to back up. Um, yeah, so uh, grad school at, at Penn was 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 great. I was here for for five and a half years. I ended up joining uh, Mara Sundrum's lab in the genetics department, working in the nematode roundworm C. elegans, and and studying uh, signal transduction pathways like RAS and Notch, and and thinking about how they're involved in promoting cell fade and cell morphogenesis. Uh, in terms of challenges, um, this idea of uh, imposter syndrome you all wanted me to, to touch upon. Um, I think it, it was certainly a challenge, especially my first year in graduate school. Um, you know, I think, you know, come, there, there were a number of us from Af African-American students who, who were uh, good friends of mine uh, then and now. We definitely formed community and that was a really important for us. I think we had a little bit of a inferiority complex or imposter syndrome coming from an a, a historically black college. And, you know, there, there were, you know, grad school is tough. So everyone struggles, especially just starting out. There's a big adjustment from, there's a different way of taking exams. Rote memory only gets you so far. You need to learn how to think like a scientist and experimentalist, design the best experiments. So it's a, it's a different way of thinking as well. So it's a challenge for everyone, but you know, I, I think there were times when myself and other classmates from underrepresented backgrounds would, you know, am I struggling because I'm black or brown, right? Is it just me? It's this thing only hard for me. And, and, and those things certainly uh, were felt. I think, you know, one thing that helped me and others power through is, you know, we would have our, our study groups amongst ourselves, African-American students, for example, but when we start to broaden a little bit and join study groups with other people, we saw, wait a minute, that this stuff is hard for everybody. <laughs> it's not just me, you know? So I, I think that was useful. Another thing like with those, um, that first year, first few years, we had classes where, you know, it, it's mainly uh, uh, presentation based. So you're reading the paper and you're doing a presentation and, and describing others' work and putting it into some large context. And I had a number of uh, professors told me, you know, you did really well in this presentation, you know, best in the, in the class and, and things of that nature. But I think I had a, a hard time accepting that phrase because there was something telling me that, are they, are they saying that I'm doing really good or good for a black person? Right, like I, I couldn't easily disentangle that. And that's something also that talking to some other underrepresented minority classmates of mine, we, we struggle, you know, are, are you saying we're doing good or we're doing better than expectation, right? Which is a difference, uh, it's a backhanded compliment if you would. Uh, but that's something else I had to, to work through and um, to, to open myself up to, to positive feedback, right? Like someone can say you're doing really good and there's, there's no strings attached to that or rooted in, in your racial identity. But that's something that, that I had to work through as certainly what was a challenge. All right, uh, so continuing on with the story. So I was um, here for five and a half years and then I did uh, two postdocs. I think for me, like the biggest change between graduate school and postdoc was that I moved into neuroscience from molecular biology and genetics. So I changed fields and um, in model organisms, I switched from uh, worms to mice. And I did two postdocs, one in olfactory, sensory neurobiology in a second and, and pain and, and somatosensation, sensation closer to what I'm doing now. And you know, I, 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 that was a huge step too, because um, Again, like going from undergraduate to graduate school, getting a PhD in molecular biology, having never taken molecular biology as an undergrad, here I am as a postdoc moving into neuroscience, having never taken a neuroscience class. I'm at it again. Um, but this is just kind of like who I am. I think, um, you know, wrapping up graduate school, the, the seminars and talks I was going to, and if I was honest with myself, the things I was most excited about, everything was pointing me towards neuroscience, all those papers you're reading just for fun. And, you know, it's thinking if you're gonna make a career about something, out, out of something and working on problems forever, you better pick a field or a set of questions that 
can can sustain you, can sustain your curiosity and passion. So this is why I, I moved into neuroscience. And, and for sure, it was a, 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 a major challenge. You get a PhD and you join a lab as a postdoc and you think you're like, now you're at the top of the, the, the pecking order. But now I felt like I started all over again. And so I was a postdoc for, I guess, six years, slightly longer than I was a graduate student. It was like I had two PhDs in time. Uh, and, and here I am as a postdoc asking graduate students the most trivial of questions, right? Because I'm learning these things, learned on the fly. Uh, and now here I am running a lab and I have neuroscience grad students in my lab. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'll just kind of fast forward uh, and then maybe open up for, for questions. So, uh, so I was a postdoc for, for um, six years, as I've mentioned, and then uh, went on the job market and eventually came here to, to arts and sciences, the biology department here at Penn. Uh, and I came here for a number of reasons. Uh, in the biology department, unlike, in, uh, unlike a basic science department in the medical school where I spent most of my time training, we do a little bit of teaching here, undergraduates. And, uh, you know, as, as, as hard and challenging as much time and effort and energy as teaching takes, I know I just taught a 90 minute class this morning. I'm still a little exhausted, but uh, I absolutely love it. You know, so I, I want, I did want a career that I was able to do first rate biomedical science and address the questions that fascinate me, but also do some level of teaching and mentorship of, of, of undergraduates. So these are some of the things that really drove me uh, uh, to the biology department uh, here at Penn. I can talk more about uh, my research too, if, if you are interested. The last little note I made to, um, oh yeah, on this idea of imposter syndrome and as a faculty member. So, you know, I would say, you know, these things don't necessarily disappear. You get better over time and you learn coping strategies. And I've certainly learned not to allow imposter syndrome to cripple me, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Especially I would say for an African-American scientist where, you know, that there are cues and signals all around you, both implicit and explicit that maybe you don't quite belong here or you're not as good as everyone else. So I'll be lying if I said I, I didn't suffer from imposter syndrome. To give you a tangible example of that, so I recently was awarded a Sloan Research Fellowship, which is um, amongst the most prestigious awards for, for junior faculty. We're fortunate to, to win that award. When I first, but uh, so I'm in my third year now on the faculty. My first year, when I first got here, I guess I thought I was hot stuff. You know, I'm going to get everything. I applied the first year, I didn't get it. The second year, I didn't apply. Imposter syndrome. The second year, I told myself, no way you'll get this award. You're not good enough. This is only going to the most elite scientists, doing the biggest, baldest questions with the greatest CVs and X, Y, Z. You can't compete with these people. I didn't even put an application in. I didn't even try. I let the imposter syndrome get the best of me. Third year rolls around. I said, you know what? Sure, only the, the, the best people get it, but Who's to say that can't be me? And I won't hold my breath, but I won't eliminate myself either. So I'm not gonna let this imposter syndrome cripple me. I'll let them tell me no, but I won't tell myself no. And you know, I was fortunate this time. So imposter syndrome certainly, you know, exists. Um, but I think I always try and still still learning how to power through it. I uh I, I remember reading a quote from Paula Hammond, Professor Paula Hammond at MIT, an African-American woman scientist. I mean, amongst the most uh, elite scientists, she's a member of all three national academies, department chair of chemical engineering at MIT. There's a book called uh, Technology in the Dream that, that I read about uh, the black experience at MIT. And she was one of the scientists that were profiled. And, and, and at this time, she was early in her career, just an assistant professor. And the interviewer asked her about imposter syndrome. And she said, of course, I suffer from it. She says, again, but I, did, I don't let it cripple me. And what I actually do is like when I, I hear those demons, you know, talking to me and, and, and I start to question myself and my abilities, she said, I just pull out my CV 
And I just stare at it and read it and remind myself that, wait a minute, I have this job because I'm qualified and I'm good. So, uh, you know, I, I think I, I take that to heart as well. And sometimes you have to remind yourself of, of what you have accomplished, how much you've overcome and remind yourself uh, when, when imposter syndrome roars its, its, its ugly head. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll stop there and happy to take more targeted questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, I am gonna, I've learned that on Zoom, sometimes it takes a minute to sort of let people, the thoughts sink in while they're ready to ask questions. I'll just say while they're doing that, that yes, that has become one of my mottos, make them say no. Um, I'm not gonna take myself out of the running. Do you think that's, if you had to, you know, if somebody asked you what's the like, biggest lesson you've learned or the like one take home message, you think that would be it or you think it'd be something else? And then we have a question from Alfredo. Yeah, that, that, that certainly is a, uh, uh, a take home lesson. Uh, let others tell you no. I think alongside that, something that I've learned and I'm in the process of learning is that you, you need assistance, you need help. So another thing I, I didn't mention with this Sloan Award is that the first time I applied, I kind of just, you know, put an application in and see, see what will happen. The second time I applied, I said, okay, I actually know some people who won this award. Let me talk with them. Let's, let me allow them to look at my app, application. Do, you, do they understand what I'm proposing here, right? Have I like made the, the, the points really critical or is, is my writing pristine? Um, so I actually spent more time getting assistance and I think, you know, I won't extrapolate to all underrepresented minorities. Maybe some things are specific to me, but I can just say in my experience, um, what I'm learning is that um, sometimes it can be hard for many of us to reach out and ask for help because we're just conditioned or we can be conditioned to believe that it's a sign of weakness. And again, this, it, it's, it's rooted in this imposter syndrome that if I keep at reaching out and asking people for help, maybe they'll discover that this person doesn't really know what's going on, right? They, they, they can't cut it. Like maybe we did make a mistake in giving this guy a laugh, uh, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Like no one succeeds without assistance and help. And that's something that I've been learning as well too, which uh, I would put alongside that, that, ev that uh, advice. Right. Don't tell yourself no, apply for things and put yourself out there, but also use your resources, use the human capital you have at your uh, disposal. Feel free to unmute yourself, Alfredo, just go. Hi, thank you so much for uh, sharing your journey and experience with us. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a question about so I think I have a similar experience in that I came from a biochemistry PhD, just started a postdoc and definitely struggling with imposter syndrome in a neuroscience lab where I feel like I don't know anything. Uh, and I'm just trying to learn a lot, but I feel like I'm not advancing fast enough. I just would love to hear your advice on um, what you suggest um, people going to new fields. Like, how did you how did you overcome that? How did I mean, I know you said that you talked to people in the lab, but like what are there like what tangible pieces of advice would you recommend for uh, anyone transitioning into a new field like this? Yeah, I, I think I'll answer that in, in two ways, uh, just based off my experience. So you mentioned like you're trained in biochemistry and now you've been on more neuroscience. So one thing, you know, maybe to think about is, is not to throw away your old training, but is there a way you can integrate some of your biochemistry background into your new field? And this is something that I did moving into a postdoc. You know, I, I had molecular background. So some of the projects I worked on did have a molecular component. But the, the other way I'll, I'll uh, answer that too is that I kind of leaned into that naivete and it, it, it benefited me greatly, right? So I moved into pain neuroscience, not knowing anything about pain or neuroscience and doing animal behavior, not knowing the first thing about how to do behavior. I was just a novice to, like every single technique that I tried, I, I didn't know how to do any of them. And so much so, like a lot of them were actually new to the lab where I was a postdoc. So 
I didn't, I couldn't even go to other people to say like, how do you do these things? So it was a lot of, of me just like teaching myself how, how to do a lot of things and being resourceful. And uh, because of that, it allowed me to ask the most basic, simple questions because I have no, you know, I'm a blank slate, tabula rosa. I, uh, I, I didn't have a, uh, you know, preconceived notions on how I thought things should be. So then I just asked really silly questions, simple questions. Why is this like this? Or why does everyone do things like that? Why are they measuring pain like this? This isn't the best way to do it. So then that allowed me to create something from scratch um, to, to kind of solve an important problem, which, which is now like one of the, the fundamental parts of my research program is developing algorithms and technologies to more objectively measure pain in mice. The only way I get there is through being a novice and not knowing anything and starting from the ground up. I'm able to ask these really, really basic questions. Um, and I think for me too, that did increase my confidence in opening a lab, right? You open a lab as a, as a junior PI and it can be worrisome, you're nervous, you, you get all these money and resources in an open lab and like now you have to produce and create and the tenure clock is clicking, uh, cl uh, talk, the, the clock is ticking. So you gotta, you gotta get on with it. You, you gotta strike fire uh, and quickly. So this is a, a, a time where all junior PIs are, are really nervous, you know, but I think I started with some degree of confidence because I said, look, I did this before. I went to a postdoc lab and I designed something with assistance and mentorship from my postdoc mentor. But, you know, I essentially designed something from scratch and built something that wasn't there. I've done this before. I can do it again in my own lab. So it gave me confidence. I think more so than if I had done maybe something a little more traditional, carried on from an extension of my PhD work into a postdoc lab, did something that was kind of the bread and butter of the lab, uh, then it might have, for me, it would have probably been a little bit scarier trying to set something up knowing that I'm used to having all these resources in a well-oiled machine, but it's like, I did it before, I can do it again. So, so I leaned into that naivete for, for my benefit, I would say. Thank you so much. Yep. So there's a question in the chat, chat from uh, Darina. I don't know if you wanna just unmute yourself and ask, but I'll read it out in the meantime. It just says, any suggestions for transitioning from a postdoc role to a faculty role. Yeah, um, get out now. No, it's, it's a joke. Um, yeah, I, I think that the biggest suggestion I would give is that um, you know we spend all this training learning how to do science. But by this point, you can do science really good. Probably a pretty good writer. You know how to convince people that you have good ideas, fundable ideas, testable ideas, but it's the, the running the lab part the, uh, that we don't get much training on typically. You know, I feel like I'm a, a, a startup uh, owner, a small business manager. You're, you're managing funds, you're managing people. Uh, a, lot, a lot of what you have to do has nothing to do with your scientific training. You, you're a leader, right? People are looking to you for direction. So, you know, I think in that transition from, from postdoc to faculty, people spend a lot of time at the bench and thinking about ideas, but, you know, it could behoove us to think about you know, leadership training, management training, you know, courses in the business school, because these are things that, you know, dealing, you know, interpersonal relationships, how to motivate people, you know, as a grad student in most, in postdoc, you know, if, if you're going to make it to, you know, running a lab, that by and large means you're a very, you're a self-starter, you're very, you have an internal fire, internal motivation, you can get yourself going. But now as the PI, principal investigator, you have to motivate a team of, of, of people. You have to get people through their lulls when, when, when they're not as excited or anxious or, or excited about a, a project, when they have a lot of negative data, how do you, you turn the corner? 
you know, a pandemic strikes, right? And, and people are working from home and, and worried about their future. Like how do you keep people motivated and hopeful? And you know, how do you steer the ship and keep it afloat? You know, I think, you know, people who are, are used to running companies or businesses or people, they get training in these things, but we kind of, we, we tend not to as scientists. So that's one thing, if I had to do it all over again, one skill set that I would try to develop as much as I could before I started, this leadership, managerial skills, m motivating and leading a, a big team of people. Absolutely. Um, so Jennifer, do you want to unmute yourself or do you want me to just read? Sure, sure I can. Hey, Ish. Hi, Ish. Um, you know, first, I guess I just want to thank you for everything you shared today. Um, I feel as though you're so busy and you took the time um, to share some of these things that I think are completely inspiring to me. Just, you know, the combination of courage coupled with the humility that you have. It's um, just awesome and really appreciate it. And I'm curious, you know, all of us have had, many of us have had those inflection point moments where it almost walked away for a variety of reasons. Did you ever have one? And, you know, what are, what can you advise us on how to, <laughs> what are your coping skills? How'd you overcome? How'd you keep it going? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, question. You just said I was humble, but now I'll give an arrogant answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever uh, thought about calling it quits or, or, or not giving back up. Um, certainly there have been, you know, challenges in an academic career. You know, as you know, a lot of failure, a lot of frustration, rejection. Um, but... I guess I feel like I, I love what I do so much that it's never con considered stopping. And this is why I also think that um, I tell like students all the time, work on a project that you're deeply, deeply passionate about. Work on something where that question is just, you, you go to sleep thinking about this question, you wake up thinking about this question, you're in the shower thinking about it, you walk the campus. I, I think you should be that passionate about the things you're working on. If you're not, then maybe you're not working on the right project or maybe this isn't the right career. So, you know, I, I feel like um, that, that keeps me going. The excitement and passion that I have for the work that I do that, when it allows me to, to, to power through, um, you know, difficult times. Um, I, you know, I shared on Twitter, I've, I've had some, you know, over my career, certainly, you know, racially hostile, racially motivated incidents within academia and outside of academia. You know, these things are, are tough and they hurt. Um, but, you know, when I get up and, and look in the mirror and, and get ready to come to work, it's still like, I wouldn't want to do anything else, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, how, how I would answer it. Um, stopping has this has never been an option or, or across my mind. That's only because I really love what I do. Now, if I get to a point where I don't love it that much or the work that we're doing is no longer inspiring to me, then I may have to figure out a different strategy, but. Leslie? Hi, I'm uh, running some experiments, but <laughs> um, thanks so much for, for your talk. It's been so great to listen about your story and, and just really so much great insight. Um, I'm kind of curious if, your experience with imposter syndrome or um, like overt hostility or anything has gone into your mentorship philosophy and goals? And if they have, what, what kind of, what are they? 
Yeah, it, it's it's a good question. Something that you know I'm I'm still working through. I, I think as a as a mentor, I try my best to be as open and vulnerable with the people that I mentor about how I experience things and and what I do. But I think alongside that, the people you mentor are not you, right? And and that's something that I'm growing with and learning with. You know, I think for me too, like imposter syndrome and, or, you know, racialized things, or um, it's just like my, my nature to just like brush things off. That's just how I am. I'm just like kind of wired that way. Um, that, that things just don't affect, it, it, it may affect me in the moment, but the next day, I kind of forgot about it on to the next thing. And it's been a great strength for sure, just to be wired that way. And to, to diverge a little bit, I, I've seen that this sort of personality trait is, is overrepresented in underrepresented minority scientists. A person who just has the ability to just brush things off. And, uh, you know, I reflect upon that a lot and thinking about the diversity or lack thereof within science, because it, it seems like, you know, you want to build a system where you're selecting for talent, innovation, creativity, right? You don't necessarily want to build a system where the minority, underrepresented minorities you're selecting for are just these resilient people who everything bounces off of them, right? Is then you know we're we're losing talented people who uh, are just not wired this way and things really stick and they can't just move on so easily. So I would say you know this this is a uh, opportunity and challenge for me as a mentor who has this ability, hardwired ability to just brush things off and keep moving, where. A trainee might not have that same fortitude. So then um, I have to work with people and kind of meet them where they're at and, and listen and learn, you know, and, you know, I try to have a, a tailored mentorship style towards each person that I mentor uh, officially or unofficially. I do a lot of unofficial mentoring and, uh, you know, just listen to people and try to offer suggestions and not necessarily impose the way I do things and how I handle things on others. I, it, it, it can be instructive, but, but not uh, try to be instructive and not prescriptive. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Lindsay? Hi, Ishmael. Hello, everybody. Hey, Lindsay. You, you can't ask a question. We already talk a lot. <laughs> I always have more questions. <laughs> but I'm wondering, like, so, you know, you talk, we talk about how you experience, like, racially charged things on, on campus and outside of campus and how, like, you have the particular strength and that you can, like, brush this kind of stuff off. But I'm wondering, like, do you have any tips for, like, because, I mean, these kind of things have happened to me, right? I'm already a first year experiencing things like a little too often <laughs> and I'm like how do you continue to work with people that you feel like have hurt you or caused harm on you like I'm staying continue to go to work every day yeah it's 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 a a uh, a wonderful question um and again like I think the the way I handle things may not be universal um I'm I'm certainly able to, to compartmentalize um, and, and you know, that, that's a whole other topic, but you know, there's some books on the shelf about Jim Watson, right? The, sure, Watson and Crick, name and structure of DNA, but he's also said some very, you know, he's been a eugenicist and said really hurtful things, but uh, I can separate those things. And it's, it could be weird that, that I can do those and I understand pushback from people who would say you can't separate people in this way, but I do. And um, I realize like human beings are, are very complex and very, you know, I, I, I try not to, to write people off. Um, uh, 
Yeah. Um, you know, I, I try not to let one incident or scenario color how uh, I perceive someone or am able to engage or interact with them. Um, you know, if, if someone's treated me a certain way or done a certain thing to me, you know, maybe this person is no longer a confidant and, you know, I'm wise about my interactions with this person, but I try my best not, not to write people off. You know, because pe people, people can change. Um, there, there's redemption. You know, there, there is a, um, there's a, a faculty member who I'm uh, uh, friends with. Um, and she's a, a white woman. And we talk about some of these things sometimes. And she tells me, she always reminds me to not write people off because she used to be a certain way. But through education, through engagement, through immersing herself deeply in the Black community, uh, she's changed. And, um, you know, the, the person that I know now, I, can't, I couldn't believe that she used to be somebody else. And, um, but, you know, people can change. And I try not to paint people with really broad strokes. So, this is something that, that I'm able to do. I just always try to see the best in people. Um, but again, like this is instructive, but it doesn't have to be prescriptive. I know everyone doesn't have the ability to do that. So I don't know. I don't know if I have the, the best answer to that. Um, this is, again, something that I, I need to work through. For, for people who, who don't have that ability to just forgive and forget and move on. Thank you. I, I think these, these things are real and they have, they, they have major implications for, for trainees. Um, you know, I, I travel a lot and talk to underrepresented minority graduate students across the nation. And when we're alone, they tell me stories and some of it is just so disheartening about the, the racialized, things that they go through in their local environments. And some of them are so brilliant and smart. And I say, well, what do you want to do when you leave grad school? They're like, I'm getting the hell out of here. I don't want to be an academic. If this is what I have to deal with, like this is, this is what I have to look forward to, right? So I think this is something that we have to, uh, we have to address, you know? One, one of my mentees, African-American uh, woman, she said, um, you know, it, it sucks that, you know, we as underrepresented minorities have to spend so much time thinking about sh learning strategies to navigate these things. Like, why can't people learn to stop, you know, being so hostile to us? Like, why does the onus, what is the, the onus on us to develop all these strategies and tools to navigate these things? It would be wonderful if we could just focus on science. Right? So, so this, this is a, a long ongoing conversation for sure, Lindsay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. I'm kinda... You did. <laughs> and I think I think that is the answer, right? I think people of color should not be having to come up with these strategies. We should be um, doing better about making sure that those sorts of actions and um, whether they're actions or words or whatever aren't happening. Um, uh, John, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Hey, Ish. Um, so we had a lot of discussions this past summer in my lab um, where we felt like our lab wasn't doing very much in terms of like, there's a lot of things happening in Philly with Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> and it was like my boss was sort of along like thinking, oh, we want to help like promote um, people of color in science. And there's there's there are vectors of doing that. and. I feel like at this point it's kind of gone by the wayside, which is unfortunate um, as these things tend to, and almost as if my boss predicted back then. But um, I was, I thought I was struck by what you said about you skipping gym class for extra bio classes in the sense that like, I was like the opposite where I actually went to extra gym classes for study halls because I, I, I was just the thing that I love doing. I love playing in like gym and I was not, I mean, I was a pretty big dork, but I was not like into classes. Um, so I guess that made me think like, is this all, it almost seems like a problem, right? Is like, you're the, you're like the, the testament of someone that succeeded in, in 
through a lot of longer odds than someone like me that had to. But then you were the person that also went to extra bio classes in high school. Do you like, how do you see, do you have any like prescriptions? I know we just talked about like, um, we don't want to have this being solved by people of color and that sort of thing. But in terms of like educating someone like me or other people about like, how do we get young people interested in science? How do we make it so it's not uncool? How do we take someone like me that um, is maybe a person of color instead, but someone like me that was like, I want to go to extra gym classes. I think that's a lot more typical and try to get them to be like, you know, science is pretty cool. It's, it's not, it's okay to not be, it's okay to be pretty dorky and to like, like these sort of things. So I think, think you kind of get my question at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and it, it's something we, we definitely need. We need um, outreach, mentorship. Um, you know, I, I think that question is not divorced from some of the things that I've just been getting at. Um, you know, underrepresented minorities need to see people who look like them, who have been really successful. This is why I love like Dr. Kismikia Corbett, who's like leading the, the led the coronavirus COVID-19 team at NIH. I think, you know, her efforts will reverberate for, for generations. She's, in, she's inspiring an entire generation of people. So one of the things that we need is to be producing more Kizzy Corbett's because we produce more Kizzy Corbett's, we produce more Lindsay's, more many other represented minorities, um, like supporting the people who are in the system now will reverberate to the next generation, right? The next generation has no one to look to because all the people there always are kicked out or leave or don't persist, then like, what do they have to look forward to? I think all of us can do things like do outreach and go into communities, you know, bring, um, you know, when I was a grad student here at, at Penn, I was the outreach chair for the E Just by Medical Society. So I spent a lot of time in graduate school working with, um, you know, local students, bringing them to labs here on campus and I mentor students through their um, their science fair projects. And, and myself and some, some of my classmates, we actually started uh, or co-founded a, a science education academy here in West Philly, which is still here now, run out of a, a white, uh, white Rock Baptist Church uh, by 52nd and, and, and Chestnut Street. So, you know, I think outreach efforts and reaching out to communities who may not, or children may not have that exposure. I think that's something that we all can do. But alongside that, because I think one thing that we tended to do in academia, when we talk about these problems, about the lack of diversity and inclusion, people say outreach, K through 12. But when you talk to underrepresented minorities, that's not the first thing we typically say. We say, treat the ones who are here, treat us better, right? Like this is part of it too. It's not always like, you have to like look internally, like look locally, right? And, you know, if I'm successful and people like me are successful, this is going to broaden the pipeline, right? Um, underrepresented minorities tend to train other underrepresented minorities. The students are more attracted to labs run by underrepresented minorities. So it's all a collective. Everything I've been talking about today is not disentangled from K through 12 in the pipeline. It's supporting the people who are here now, making sure we're successful and that we stay and we, we, we're we retained and we feel supported. This will affect the entire ecosystem. I'll add quickly, I appreciate your work on Twitter talking about all the dusty photos of old white men in, in Penn. It would be awesome to see some of those changed, so. Yeah, yeah, you know, speaking of that, you know, the. Uh, you know, that, that's something tangible. I remember just talking to some colleagues and they were remarked, you know, you think our underrepresented minority undergraduates are, uh, you know, what do they think when they walk through the halls and they see nothing but, you know, old white men who, who've done, you know, amazing accomplishments, but, you know, what do you think that underrepresented minority students are thinking? And I would say, you know, forget the students, what do you think the professor is thinking? 
I had to, I have to teach in this class too. Like, what do, you, what do you think I'm thinking when I look around? Like, it affects me. So I know it affects an 18 year old, right? Um, you know, th those are small things that, that we can do that, that have like profound consequences. And, um, you know, when I mentioned this college, we're like, wow, you know, I never thought about it like that. And it also goes to show that we have to be at the table. You have to you're not going to solve this problem if there are no underrepresented minorities at the table discussing these things with you and their experiences, right? And I, I think one thing that, uh, a benefit that we've seen in this last year is that people have been more receptive to begin to listen to us, right? And our experiences and, and use that to, to kind of move forward together. Well, before we got on, Ishmael was um, lamenting the fact that he was running from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, and I'm afraid he's got another one coming up at four, so we're going to have to relinquish his uh, time with us, um, although I'm sure many of us have many, many more questions. Um, maybe there will be another time. Uh, in the meantime, yes, just thank you so much uh, for taking this time and uh, sharing with us, and um, we hope to see you all next month when we have another conversation with uh, Royal Hamilton. Um, so um, bye everybody. Sounds great, thanks, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yep, I enjoyed it, take care. Thank you so much. Um... Oh, you stopped recording. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs>